Let's start then with the first part about the MPC. So as you all probably have seen in the exhibition, all MPC works perfectly well for flat terrain and the robot is blind. And the last few years we have been starting to think about how can we include also perception into these MPC pipelines and uh, really try to push it to the limit. So going to these scenarios where perception is really vital, where there are only a few footsteps available and the robot needs to coordinate its whole body to across the terrain. And from the beginning, we've said we have to move away from this decomposed thinking of locomotion. So in classical approaches, we have like separate footstep planners, torso planners, swing leg control. And we wanna to try to put that all in one optimization such that the optimization can um, bring us the coordination between legs and feet. But of course, the question then becomes, what should I put in here? And especially when you look at the terrain, um, terrain is often non-convex, non-linear, is continuous, you have missing data, outliers. Basically, this is the nightmare of any gradient-based optimization that we use in MPC. So we have to do something here, and one proposal has actually been done by Avian Yenoten, so you will find this poster here in the back and the right. And what he proposes is to first smooth terrain, and then from that, initialize the next optimization on an increasingly um, realistic um, representation of the terrain. But in, in my work, we did it a little bit different. So what we did is we take the elevation map and in the first step, classify which part of the map is steppable and non-steppable, and then find for all the steppable regions, the boundary of individual planes in the scene. And then before each MPC problem runs, we take a nominal foothold, we project it on the best plane that's closest to it, and we extract a convex inner approximation. So in this way, you hide all the nasty uh, numerical problems that you normally have in the terrain, and you only expose the total constraint as a convex set. Additionally, we need to avoid the terrain, to not bump into it. So we have a sign distance field that we use for collision avoidance, and we have a smoothened version of the terrain to align the torso with. Okay, so then about the robot model. Uh, the model that we use has 48 states, consists of torso and joint positions plus a system augmentation. So we can impose smoothness on the solution that comes out of the MPC. And as inputs, we have contact forces and joint velocities. And then over this state and inputs, we have quite simple cost function, I would say, just about following the commands for the torso, aligning it to that layer I showed you before. And for each of the legs, we have a kind of nominal motion that we think it should follow. I think the, the main locomotion comes from the constraints. So as I said, we have this convex foot placement constraint. And for each of the knees, we add a collision sphere with the terrain, we impose friction cones, we impose joint limits, and we have a, a particular lift off and touchdown velocity that we like to achieve. So when we put that all together, we have here an MPC running all on board on the robot with online mapping and perception. You see here map that it builds the segmentation. You will see the next two nominal footholds getting projected onto the terrain and the complex constraints that will enter the MPC. And then especially for this last step up here, it's very important to have the collision avoidance. Otherwise, it was always bumping its knees against that table. And it, yeah, in the bottom, you will always see the, the internal state representation of, of the MPC. So let me give you a little bit of detail of what is running here on board. Um, we have the elevation mapping and all this classification and segmentation running at 20 hertz. Then the nonlinear MPC is really at the core of everything. So that one takes the user inputs, state estimate, and provides the, the high frequency reference to a whole body controller and some reactive control blocks. And then um, additionally, we have, of course, the, the state estimator and, and disturbance observer. And in terms of the solver that we use, before we uh, used a lot of these DDP based methods. For this work, I actually found that the problems get really hard and doing this full rollout along a directory often became unstable. So I switched to a, a multiple shooting approach where each of the shots is 0 0.15 to seconds, and we have a horizon length of about one second. For that, we use the structure exploiting solver HPIPM and 
the nonlinear SQP loop you can find in our OCS2 toolbox. So these algorithms make a, a linear quadratic approximation around the previous solution. Then we solve this recovery line equation and do a line search on, on stated inputs. And these are about the timings that you achieve with that. So uh, it's about 50-50 between doing the approximation and solving the problem. Um, most of the problems we can uh, keep up with 100 hertz. And then, um, yeah, there's some variance just depending on how the problem looks, how the terrain looks. When we put that all together, we can now do these scenarios where very sparse footholds are available. So I'm here joysticking the robot to just giving it some high level velocity commands and it's deciding by itself where to step and um, how to move the body accordingly. Again, here you will see in the corner the, the representation that's there and I have to really thank Akihiro for doing a good job on providing such a nice map uh, that remains stable over this locomotion. So the challenge is here that we only have cameras in the front and the back on this version of animal. So while it's walking here, it doesn't see the terrain for a long while. And as it goes back, has to step on those individual stepping stones. We were also able to, to take it out the outdoor. So now we don't have a particular stair climbing mode or so. It's the same cost function as you saw on stepping stones, and it's able to here uh, go all the way up. And in the second part of the video, make it back down. And if we go to the nice world of simulation, and really push this to limits. So there's now a running gate over stepping stones over some stairs uh, and some rubble in the end. And in simulation, this works 100% 100% of the time with any gate. I would say that is that is pretty solid. And we can also do some more exotic gates. So this is a gallop. Again, the same cost function as you saw before. This is um, very exciting in simulation. We are working on, on getting that on the hardware system as well. Basically, every contact phase, it's hitting the torque limits and velocity limits of the system. Now, in the spirit of this talk, we compare on that scenario against the RL controller of Takahiro. The top coming from the left and in the bottom coming from the right. And you see, as soon as there's like these negative obstacles where you really have to use your perception to make the right decision, the RL controller fails and, and falls in between. And we are able to make it all across the gaps. Uh, but that, that was the pretty part. There's also some uh, less pretty parts about this work. So what if the map is wrong? And um, there I've used basically what we've learned about blind locomotion. So if you're early in contact, you use that contact and replan. If the contact is late, uh, well, you don't really know what to do, but you can try to, to move the foot down to establish contact. And uh, an, an interesting question is here then, what do you do with the next swing phase? And it, it's, yeah, to avoid doing a lot of if else statement, I just trust the map again, and it will keep making the same and same mistake, basically, if, if the map is wrong. Thank you, Ruben. Then I will talk about the learning based method, and I will meet you a PhD student. So Ruben's MPC controller achieves a very amazing performance, but what if we go in the wild environment? So in this case, the Ruben's controller tried to go into this vegetation here, and it's wrong, and then it tried to step on the grass and it couldn't recover from it. And this kind of uh, issue often happens if we bring the robot in the wild environment. In the vegetation, like all the grass looks like a steppable obstacle for the robot, or in snow, you don't see any information, or even if you see the surface, that surface is different from where the robot can step on. And there are a lot of these situations that we encountered in the wild environment with these multi map situations. So, what I tried was to tackle this from the learning based approach. 
So what we can think about how to input this extractive information from the map to the uh, neural network-based controller, the most naive <coughs> approach would be to sample the height, any height around the foot, and just directly input in the neural network. And I tried this, and it worked fine in a lab environment. So I could go over these steps, or I could go over these stairs, but I found that when we deployed it in the wild environment, this didn't work as well. So here, the robot was trying to step on some grass, or when the robot sees this wrong map, and once the robot sinks into the map, this controller couldn't also handle this faulty information. So if you see the our controller, which doesn't use the extra section, which is the workflow engine on B from our lab, this is quite robust. So this is only using the proprioceptive information, which doesn't have any visual information, and it could achieve a very robust behavior. But to walk over the set, it had to feel by touching or hitting the edges. And what we want to also have by adding the extra section is to have a more smooth smoothness by anticipating what's going on. So how can we achieve the both? robustness and the smoothness at the same time, even when the map can collapse, like what we saw before. So here, uh, in this work, we propose to use the leaf encoder, which combines both the proprioception, which is the body information of the joint state, body orientation, plus the extraception, which is coming from the map. And inside this encoder, it has the attention date. And based on the context, if the extraception seems to be correct, it directly uses this information in the belief state. But when it seems to be not correct, it can block this information and ignore this information and then purely rely on the proprioception. So to train this, we use the two stage training. First, you train the teacher policy, which have all the grounds of information in simulation. So you first train this locomotion policy using reinforcement learning and giving all the possible information like ground truth, height scan, or friction coefficient, external disturbance. And then once you have the teacher policy, you train the student policy, which tries to mimic this teacher policy, but from very noisy height scan. Here's a bit more detail. So you train the teacher policy on the different terrains and adding a lot of randomization, like foot friction, adding external disturbance, and it gets all the information of these as a privileged information. And it tries to follow the command velocity. We use the PTO to train this uh, teacher policy. And then once we have this teacher policy, we try to train the student policy from a limited information. So you don't give the privileged information, plus you add a lot of noise in the height scan, and still tries to mimic the teacher action, which have all the information. So what is recognized in the belief state is here. So first, it trusts the map, so it tries to step on this front block. But once it realizes that this block is soft and the actual terrain height is here, it revises its belief and still adapts to this. So in this transparent obstacle, it can also go over. And if we can use this extra receptive data, it can use for smooth motion, but still we can cover the sensor. And even if it is covered, it can estimate that uh, there's a step by feeding of the step. As a result, we could deploy this controller in the very various environment, in the mountain or in the stairs or in those like a rocky hill, also going up and down in indoor stairs, in the forest, in the snow, here's on the mountain. And 
during this deployment, the uh, robot didn't fall at all, and it could kind of robustly travel all kinds of things. Also, to check how robust it is, we did some hiking experiment in the mountain in Switzerland. So this was kind of one hour hike up and down, and the robot did finish this hike. I think I have already talked about this in the keynotes. I will skip this part. And also, this controller was used during the keynote session going over. So then about the discussion, I will first talk about some downside of the RL. So although it can achieve a very robust behavior, tuning the policy was sometimes not very free. In this example, this policy was a bit hesitating in front of the stairs, and I was not sure why I was doing this. So I was tuning, trying to change the command following reward were trying, trying different stuff. And in the end, what was the reason was it was getting some edge penalty. So when you step near the edge, it was getting some penalty. And that was because it was hesitating. As you see, this is a bit non trivial tune. And also, training takes long time. So you need to wait until the, you get the new policy and this tuning process takes time. Maybe uh, after simulation and more research to make use it. But compared to MPC, it could take more time. Yeah, that, that's what I found with the, the MPC. It actually, it's it's quite intuitive to tune these things. You know exactly which term in the cost is doing what. Um, you see the robot doing it wrong, so you increase uh, that, that part of the cost. Um, and and you can do this super fast. I mean, you can change the config file and you run another experiment. So. Within a day, you can have a, a very good tuning for your MPC controller. Um, but but I have to say, you are a little bit limited in the type of costs and constraints that you can do because you always have to keep in mind that you have to be able to solve this in real time. So doing something more than quadratic costs or or some nonlinear barriers is is very hard to realize. Um, so we are a bit limited in that, and that's why we can also not express the noise very well in, in the map or, or something like this. So I, I would say both Takiro and me have seen that doing real world perception is very hard and the first tries in, in both our cases failed. Uh, he found a, a very nice solution on his side to combine the broker reception and the expert reception. For the NPC, I found this hard because making this discrete um, choice between using the map or not doesn't really scale to, to all these environments that he shows. Uh, on the other hand, with the MPC, we can be very exact and place our foot exactly on the stepping stone and coordinate the rest of the motion. Um, and due to the robustness a little bit as well, the RL sort of um, assumes there's always ground that it can step on. So that makes, uh, makes these mistakes. So then I guess the question that we, we have in our head at the moment is, can we combine this robustness now that we see from RL with the, the precision and look ahead of, of the MPC? So this is the, the question that we want to put back to you and hopefully see some exciting results uh, in the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent talk, and I think it's still open questions. Um, are there any questions from the audience asking for clarification? Um, uh, I, I really like the example of the date. Um, but in the MPC case, you, know, you give us information that you need. So it is a bit on fast. What did you mean as information? Because if using the vision and also the prototype, I don't think you're using the MPC input from the prototype in the same way that we use. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm, I'm using the map. It is using the same map. And um, I'm using the joint measurements, the current measurements, and, and he's doing that as well. Um, yeah, but with, uh, so I think, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, like, um, it's, 
extrapolating from the history of measurements what the belief over the world should be that that is something that I'm currently not able to do. I'm sorry, are you also looking at the information from the response of science in the So the the observer is used to estimate ground interaction. If you push the base, the model will know that, and it will use the the external force to update the model. Yeah. Have any more questions? Do we have any more questions? No, um, I have one question here. My question is Hello? Um, if there are like chain or some non trivial phenomenon that could be not ideal, like what is the sequence of the chain analysis? So uh, when I tune, I hypothesize like different hypotheses, like why this behavior is coming. And I try all like one by one and figure out what was the exact reason. So sometimes it is cost function, sometimes it is the environment, sometimes it's the hyperparameter. So until you try, uh, I was not able to really reason beforehand. So there were we have a room for one more question, last question. Um, I have one question here regarding the computational cost. There's not, thank you. Uh, thank you.